you for joining us this afternoon. We're talking about robots versus recruiters, um, part of the great debate on humans versus machines. Uh, we're going to highlight, is it really one versus the other, or is it a combination of the two? And where does blending the arc of human potential begin? So to start, I have a question for Ashu. Um, let's begin with where you feel AI plays the largest role in the hiring process, whether it's with outreach and engagement, is it targeting passive um, prospects, or is it at, more at the apply stage when you're applying for a role? Thanks, Britt. Uh, thank everyone. Really excited to be here today. So in today's time, if you think of the talent acquisition, right, you can no longer think of it in isolation. It is the entire life cycle of the talent from the first time someone joins to stays in your company, leaves, and after that they may come back, right? So when you think of applying AI, right, it is extremely important for, first of all, for the system to understand who will perform well in your organization, who will be successful, who will stay, and what will they do afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. So when you start applying it to only a piece and not other, you don't get the full benefit of that. So whether it starts by providing the right experience to every candidate, to understand why they are a good fit in your company, what will get them excited about your company, to helping you on the sourcing side to understand what kind of people you should be reaching out to, on the screening side to understand what capabilities this person really have. So as a simple example, like resume is a self-attested piece of doc. Anyone can say whatever they want on their resume, right? But what is really relevant, what they are saying is that indeed true or not, how well they know that stuff, to think of the interview panel, right? Who should be interviewing this candidate? What questions they should be asking this candidate? Uh, and what are the candidates concerned and how they should get addressed? Because some of this should map to the, during the onboarding time. When someone is already has joined your company, how do you retain those people? Like quite a few times we talk about like retaining the people when they have started uh, reducing the engagement, right? But that's a losing battle. The person has already reduced the engagement, right? So you have to be really thinking about like, can I predict what's going to happen with this person? How will they get exci stay excited? And even after they were to leave, how can I keep them warm and engaged? And again, what will keep them excited? So to me, apply AI to each of these processes, not just one or the other. Uh, Arthur, can AI be leveraged to find net new talent for an organization and how? Thank you. Um, yeah, to build on Ashu's point, I think uh, robots are good at pattern matching and identifying the some series of judgments uh, that humans are slower and take time to build the data set to make consistently. I think most of uh, the recruiting teams that I've worked with have gone into recruiting because they really care about discovering what do humans uh, value and how will those values best be expressed in the form of their work. For us, we're partnered with a number of organizations such as Fetcher or Top Funnel um, that have proven successful at taking the scripts that we've applied to discover and pattern match successful candidates out in the wild. It's easy enough to find open source web data such that it doesn't quite make sense um, to pay the hourly cost of a salaried sourcer that is um, out there trying to find uh, candidates when you can do the work of finding and generating those lists quicker and more consistently um, by building off the data sets that others have discovered and pattern matched for you. For us, um, it starts with having a clean enough data infrastructure that we understand the breadth of folks that we have already reached out to, what has separated those that have moved forward through our processes, as well as those that have been successful down the candidate life cycle. And for us, uh, taking that and building it into repeatable rules-based discovery is the trajectory that we're on. Um, at this point, it comes down to an efficiency trade-off and having the right series of human judgments to guardrail that, because um, bad inputs in equals bad outputs out. Um, and so we're very conscious of, in the process of discovering that new compounding bias, as well as um, creating too much homogeneity in the folks that we're attracting and discovering over time. So I'll jump in, you know, part of when I, when I got the invite for, for this meeting, my mind went straight to my favorite Tom Selleck movie of, of Runaway and the small, you know, robot spiders that chase people around. And I, you know, I think to a certain extent, I think there's a long runway 
for, for AI and robotics, certainly, but I think we're, we're clearly, as, as we are in a lot of other spaces, really in the early stages, and I think um, there is still so much that our recruiters do, particularly around the sourcing component for us, that I think you know, where we're starting to apply it at Dropbox in the really early stages is in some of those more repetitive actions and in, um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, helping us to, to solve uh, some problems that have good de and clear definitions around them. And I think that the um, talent supply mapping, the um, surfacing of, of uh, candidates that we might not have discovered using normal Boolean searches or other, other techniques like that are certainly things that are on the horizon but not, not quite where they need to be to, to really ensure that we're not introducing new biases um, into, into an already somewhat biased system. Great. And Steve, um, how can we use AI to predict internal mobility? So when to engage with a current employee who may be at a point in their career where they're looking to shift within the organization? Right, well the first thing I would say is that um, we gotta be careful about like what AI is and what AI isn't. You know, there's a tremendous amount of hype around AI right now. Just like in every three or four years, we get this new word that we all glum onto for like three years. And then it kind of goes away, kind of the Gartner hype cycle, and it kind of goes to this kind of valley or this trough, if you will, of disillusionment, they call it, I think. Predictive so, analytics. Yes, <laughs> predictive <laughs> analytics would be an example of that. So, so um, if you're talking about AI as it relates to employee mobility, um, the first thing is, is that AI today is predominantly an incremental innovation. It's not a revolution. So when it comes to employee mobility, it's no different there than it is with talent acquisition generally, which is you're matching people against jobs at scale. The good thing about AI is that you get access to massive amounts of data and you can do some pattern recognition. Right? The, the bad part about AI is that it's still not in a place with employee mobility or with talent acquisition where it may be a distinction without a difference today. It may be that we're putting all this money and this time and this energy into AI and the payoff may not be there with employee mobility or with talent acquisition. And so we're in the really early days and you gotta go really slow. So with employee mobility specifically, um, it will be really good. It's really good at sending job alerts to current employees against their data that you have available, which is different than in talent acquisition. In talent acquisition, the only available data you have is stuff you can pull from the ether, you know, scrape, or it's a resume. In, in, in employee mobility, you have performance appraisals, you have 360 reviews, you have trainings and assessments. You have a whole bunch more data, which makes it even more difficult. And AI today has been predominantly on the talent acquisition side, less on the employee mobility side, which means it's even further away from employee, for employee mobility. Unless you're work day, of course, where you have all the data. <laughs> so it brings me to my next question. Is there an opportunity to leverage AI for a better employee experience? Um, getting ahead of training and development opportunities for an employee, um, perhaps offering insight into a shift like like we just spoke about. Um, Neil, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think you know, I and mean, I think there are absolutely applications. I think um, in, in terms of ensuring that the employee experience is one that they, you know, again in these early stages are receiving consistent information, and we are doing less around ensuring that whether it's managers or HR practitioners or, or whomever who are delivering information that, that employees need to whether it's do their job or, or work at the company. I think those are some of the early earliest stages where we can ensure that an experience is better, right? Whether it's calling into a call center or sending an email and waiting for a response, that's not a great you know, employee experience at the moment. Um, I think the things that are, are to come are more um, simulation based, right? So when we go back to the training that we need, need to do for hiring managers or, um, or employees in general on sales topics or, or, or other, other um, kind of productivity enhancers, I think that there is a role for AI to eventually play in building out and being a safe space for employees to learn new skills or to, to develop in some of these areas. So um, again, I think there's a long runway. Um, at, at Dropbox, if we just go back to the internal mobility um, piece, I think we've been looking at three to four different um, key drivers of engagement, 
uh, and retention. And ultimately, at least in the last uh, three years of data that we have, we're, we're not seeing one single thing other than time being that driver for, for retention. Um, there are drivers of engagement, there are drivers of, of performance, but there is not one driver yet, again, amongst our population that we have the sample set for. Um, so again, I think that it, it will be hard for AI, ML, robots, you pick your word, to be, you know, until that data set is available and it can be proven out in the, in the next sample set that it's about to be applied to uh, for it to be valuable. And to add on to that, how do you influence decision making at a leadership level while using the data that you collect through the AI? Yeah, so I think we try to um, you know, use techniques that lots of, of folks before us have, which is really um, share our, our thesis or a set of problem statements, get alignment on, on that, that problem statement and, and the thesis, uh, propose a set of options that include from the range of traditional solutions to more innovative or, or um, you know, broken edge solutions, and and really try to prove them out. We tend to have an organization that's um, quite open to experimentation, so we run between one and three uh, experiments per quarter in our recruiting organization, and so you know that um, building that muscle of being uh, being okay with experimentation has helped at least me. Uh, share share those thesis and and ultimately get support for for the recommendations that come out of those experiments and and the leadership is is open to them. Great. Uh, my next question is for Ashu. When designing AI recruiting software, as you're the CEO of Eightfold, um, how may end users be a part of the design process in what they're trying to solve for using your technology? So the way we look at things, right, that the world is moving from what we used to call system of records to really system of intelligence. Uh, like if you take Google as an example, right, what makes Google exciting? It, it is not that they have access to a trillion documents. What makes it exciting is that with one click, right, you get the most relevant document. So the system of intelligence have three key components. One is the data. You need to have all the data in one place. You need to be able to normalize it, analyze that data, and make it relevant. The second one is algorithms. Actually, like I've been working in this space for the last 20 plus years now. And one funny thing is that in late 90s, we used to call it machine learning, not AI. Hmm. Today, we call it AI and not machine learning. Uh, but really, the kind of algorithms that are available today, you can do a lot with that stuff, right? Uh, from a simple thing like, what kind of people are likely to be successful? What kind of career trajectories these people have had in the past? To more importantly, if you think about it, right, the rate at which the new skills come in the market today and disappear is extremely fast. Golang, like the previous session was on AI and machine learning algorithms, right? That language did not exist four years back. Blockchain was the hottest piece of technology last year. It's already gone, right? So to be able to identify what someone can do versus just what they have done. And third, which is what your question now comes back to, is the workflows. So they're robots, and then they are humans, and they need to work together, right? So how do you intelligently weave everything into one another? And what it requires is a key focus on working with the customers, weaving it into their workflow, enabling it. So a simple example of thing that we are about to launch is, let's say you're trying to schedule an interview with a candidate, right? There are two ways. One is that, or, I mean two setups, right? In one case, you have a candidate, you're like, okay, I'm available next week, I will meet. On the other hand, if you learn that this is a really, really a superstar candidate, you have just gotten lucky to get access to that candidate, you want to drop everything and meet that candidate now. So can you have a workflow around that stuff as an example, right? Or as a recruiter, right, when you're trying to set up a panel of an interview, right, it gets so painful. Like, I want the first interview with this guy. If that interview goes well, then I want to do this thing. And you want to pick two out of these four people for the next two hours, followed by the hiring manager, followed by the cultural interview, right? How do you build processes around that stuff, right? Or CRM, how do you build processes around mass engagement? I can give you a specific example, actually, around um, 
uh, employee feedback, so or, or just feedback from the mm -hmm. customer to your question specifically about that. So um, AI is really good at pattern recognition, right? And so if we have access to 100 million resumes, we can see patterns in that stuff. So let's reduce the sample size. We work with like Macy's. Macy's has 18 million resumes in their database or profiles in their database. We can look at historical hiring patterns and see how they've hired in the past for certain positions. The problem with that, and we do that, the problem with that is that you get signal bias. It's almost like whether you're liberal or you're conservative politically, the more you click on liberal news and the more you click on conservative news, you get a lot more of the same stuff, right? So the problem with signal, you get the signal bias in AI that starts to drive up maybe some really, a lot of your bad habits or your bad patterns. So how do you solve for that? We need customers to do that. So because otherwise the algorithms themselves are gonna go awry. And a specific example of that is Eli Lilly. So we work with Eli Lilly, and Eli Lilly hires a lot of pharmaceutical sales reps. A lot of those pharmaceutical sales reps tend to be 22 to 20 or to 35 year old women. Well, our algorithm picked out Smith College. Smith College is an all women's college in the Northeast. and started signaling like crazy on Smith College. The challenge with that is that it's now signaling so much on Smith College that it's actually, and there's so much hiring happening from that, that school specifically, that it's actually pulling away from some of these other schools where you have really good candidates. And so it's that type of stuff that you need to have monitors on top of this stuff to ensure that it doesn't go nuts. Facebook is in the news for this type of stuff, right? But not in talent acquisition. But the same thing that applies to Facebook happens <coughs> to talent acquisition and AI, and it happens often when you have a lot, a lot of data. And so you need good training sets. And the training, a lot of times, is the explicit feedback you get from recruiters that actually you can look in the apply flow and you can see, oh, this, these, this set of candidates was recently, um, th there was some disposition code around that set of candidates for whatever that reason was, or this set of candidates was screened but didn't make it to an interview. That type of stuff is really important when you get feedback from customers. Thank you. So Arthur, what are some of the emerging capabilities associated with automation and machine learning um, in regards to the hiring process in your, your sourcing roles? Sure. To build on what Steve mentioned, I think um, across the board, the problem uh, that we're looking to solve is better understanding talent market liquidity. Uh, all the data is out there in the ether. I think when we're designing our roles, um, having access to that data and ways to automatically understand that if we add this or that skill set to the job description, we're adding this much extra time to fill, we're adding this much more complexity um, by removing percentage points off our conversion from recruiter screen to hiring manager screen and down the funnel. Fundamentally, what um, AI is giving us is a relatively unbiased sample set of external data and a better way to validate certain hiring hypotheses before we expend the time and effort of rerunning our funnel to learn the same lessons that we should have learned from our data sets before. This primarily comes into place in the discovery phase as well as in outreach. If we understand that this piece of marketing collateral performs better with this candidate population at a rate of two to one, then we should be using the content that works and that appeals to them, and we should be layering that into the nurturing and re-engagement experience um, so that we're continuing to drive efficiency. Um, to the point of how do we integrate users um, into this, um, we've experienced the same where this is most certainly not set it and forget it. Um, we don't get the same efficiency back even if we hold conversion rate and outreach rates constant. Um, we're finding that if we're adding a certain amount of extra incremental leads um, utilizing some of these outreach and uh, discovery engines, um, we still need to account for the time that it's taking for that recruiter or that sourcer to calibrate and to maintain the running of a the machine. Um, there are obviously um, different trade-offs to getting that formula right, but what we're actually finding is that it's um, increasing the development of the sourcers and recruiters to become better at calibrating um, and holding hiring managers accountable by saying, hey, um, you have now seen this profile five times that you are telling me to look for. Um, this profile is actually not converting. Um, this is what the external data is telling me. Um, we're going to run out of this profile um, before you find the match that you think you're gonna find here. And so it's a matter of um, empowering recruiters to use this to accelerate their productivity rather than uh, simply sort of leaving it on and seeing it as a competitor to the recruiters. Yeah, maybe just adding on to that, you know, because I think in addition to pulling down pass-through rates, I'd say the other benefit of, of running, I think, again, the, the search 
queries through through some kind of processing is diversity because I think there is a, a, a secondary set of data that we can share with our hiring managers that say if these requirements or these nice to haves that you outline within within your job spec are removed or changed we're able to actually expand the diversity of the of the candidates or the pipeline that we're presenting to you and it's important for us to be able to start to be able to do that earlier again if i'm sequencing the thing i share with all the companies that are out there building these tools i would say to me that talent supply mapping um, uh, search query optimization and and um, expansion are the capabilities that that my teams would use you know really quickly out of the gate and a final question is where do we ultimately think this technology is going in relationship to the recruitment function the technology that's now in play the AI the machine learning all of it rolled into one where do you think the largest impact is going to be and when I, I, I think that we are, this is incrementalism. Like th This is really slow roll. Um, there is use for AI. Obviously, I'm the CEO of an AI company. Um, so obviously, I want you all to embrace yes. it. But the truth is, is that like this is something that's a slow roll. This is not disruptive Silicon Valley technology that's going to have a massive impact on your businesses over the next two years or three years. But over time, it's going to get baked into almost everything you do. So AI over time um, is uh, it's a feature. It's not, AI by itself is, you know, a lot of times there's disruptive technologies that are platforms. AI is not a platform. It's kind of baked into everything that you're doing just because the access to data is so massive now. Whereas 10 years ago, uh, we didn't have clouds and data and all that stuff. But now that we have access to that data, AI will be involved. It's just that it's gonna be a really slow roll. That's my kind of general take. And I'd be cautious, but optimistic. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And I think, you know, again, if we're already seeing some of the, the thrash back from access to data that's more about our consumer life, you know, imagine how we'd feel if that's happening with much more personal data, data about uh, ourselves, about our, our, our past work history, our bank accounts, et cetera. Like, you know, you're just talking about a much more sensitive data set. And so um, getting access to the, to, to the data sets that are going to be required to really step change or to deliver the capabilities that, again, are more, more significant, um, we're going to have to implement more safeguards, get more, get more used to things. So I think it is absolutely a, a multi-year journey. I agree. It's not, it, it's not a platform. It is a set of capabilities that are going to be uh, you know, selectively implemented across processes to deliver value. Yeah, I think at a high level, there are a lot of solutions in search of problems right now. Um, I think where you see the um, evolution of the function going is similar to the evolution of marketing technology. Um, right now, you know, for a consumer marketing company, um, the profiles of the team and the development required um, tends to um, lean more analytical. We're seeing that in the evolution of recruiting becoming more data-driven, becoming more of a proactive business function, um, having to not only justify its worth to the business, um, but have a seat at the table in terms of more future casting, workforce planning, what have you. Um, and so I think the evolution is primarily going to be felt in the expectations of the workforce becoming more like robots in their day-to-day -day before the robots actually wind up taking over. Um, and I think jury's still out on a lot of that because I think the nature of what um, the marketing trend line has taught us is that it still um, requires a greater complexity of the people that are actually calibrating and the people that are actually building and maintaining this technology. Um, and so it changes the nature of the work, um, but it doesn't um, fundamentally disrupt it in a very punctuated sense. Uh, I think uh, I will add a few things over here. And partly given coming from a slightly different background, right? I'm a lot more optimistic about AI. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so here's an example of a work that we are doing. With Norwegian government, what that government is focused on is placing disabled people back into the workforce. And so they have these large number of people, all these companies. But today, what happens is that these people have no access to the jobs. So they, what they are doing is they are using our platform to enable that, to identify all these people who are disabled, 
who are out of the workforce, in which company, in which role these people can be a good fit, and enabling companies to hire these people. That is a kind of an example of a thing that was not possible without technologies that are out there today. Like, uh, one very common thing is that the generalization in AI systems, right? They can generalize extremely well if you have implemented them correctly, right? And what it enables is that matching at a massive, massive scale with the globalization, right? Uh, let me do a quick sample over here, right? How many of you guys do know about Fudan University? How many of you guys know about Bits Plani College in India? How many people know about Chingua? And you see these different uh, gaps. Some people know about some place, some know about other place, right? Fudan is the number three ranking university in China. Bits Plani is among the top 10 engineering colleges in India. Chingua is the number one engineering college in China, right? These are some of the top colleges. Now, if we don't know about each of these, we will be biased against them. You will pick the one that you know, and everything else you will ignore, right? And what AI can do is start by removing all those biases on day one. Like one very other common bias that we talk about is ageism. Like if you are 50 year old, finding a job as a software engineer in Silicon Valley is almost impossible. Don't even try. It's that bad, right? Uh, and what can you do is guide companies, guide people on both sides, right? How can we enable that? So if you say that how much of the recruiter's work is going to change, I think it will change. It's not that the that recruiters are going away, but now they can be a lot more focused on engaging with the candidates, building relationship, building relationship with the employees, right? They can do a much better job. Uh, but the overall workforce is changing dramatically. I think it's leveling the playing field for everyone. It won't happen in a year. I totally agree with that. It's going to take it, take 10 years, 20 years. But we are on that journey now. And the good news is that, unlike the last time when there was multiple times AI winter, I would say right now, what people have changed is that no one is expecting AI to make wonders, right? We don't have to wait for level five autonomous driving. Level two is changing our lives already. So what people have changed the mindset is that let's start taking baby steps. Let's start incorporating it in that process, collecting the data, keep improving things, uh, and one day we'll get there. Thanks. So I, I can share at Workday, we're extremely excited about the use of AI and machine learning and our technology as well. Uh, the, the focus really is about how we enable our talent to work smarter and not harder, and how we eliminate some of those manual tasks using AI um, and filter through a lot of the data. So I wanted to open it up um, to questions from the audience. If you, we have a mic coming. Are you concerned at all about early adopters of ATS systems having bad experiences with sort of machine assisted or machine learning, um, HR sifting, and then being soured on the more advanced versions that are coming? I had the unfortunate experience of looking for jobs this summer. I can tell you in the difference of one year, it went from some companies using an ATS to all of them using an ATS. And from a computer science perspective, they were bad. I was applying for a position that wanted experience with databases, and I had this whole entry on my resume that said database. Mm -hmm. And literally, the difference between the singular and the plural mm -hmm. completely knocked my percentage down to the point where a human would never see that. So everybody's jumping on the ATS bandwagon, and it's automated, but it's not very good. And are you sort of cautioning people to wait till it gets better, or what's your strategy there? I can start. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's to a certain extent what some of us shared, which is it, it is on a path. And I think there is absolutely um, a role for humans in the, in the short term uh, for, for the exact reasons you're listing. There's also no standard taxonomy yet, right? There's no standard taxonomy of skills. There's no standard taxonomy of competencies. Pick your, like, that there, there are still inherent framework challenges to really applying this technology and these, some, of these, some of these pieces. So uh, do, do I think that should hold us back from adopting or trying them out? No, but people need to understand what, what the balances are and, and, and what some of the um, 
what the opportunity is to learn without necessarily, you know, um, being scared by by what the results tell them. Because again, I think we're all learning. Yeah, I would just add on to that that um, to the skills taxonomy, which I think is exactly right. There's no standardization across skills taxonomies or companies and jobs. A, a, a salesperson at Microsoft is vastly different than a salesperson at Caterpillar, right? So understanding that. Um, AI today is really good with rigid job descriptions and rigid jobs. A nurse has a very classic career arc. It's really easy for AI to get a, their, its hands around that. Consultant is really hard. And so the challenge is, is that the more rigid it is, the better it is today. And therefore, I would not let this thing go wild in your organization. You're making a huge mistake and you're setting yourself to fail. I'd set up some very specific use cases. I'd roll it out against those. I'd measure it. And then I'd incrementally do it to the next organization. I'd be really careful about, because of the issues you just described, mm -hmm. there's, there's, we're, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, to play the other side of that, um, some of the technologies that we've seen, particularly those that have ingested a large amount of data, um, when we have our sourcers or recruiters searching for folks, um, they actually incorporate common typos. Um, so if you're self-describing but you might have um, misplaced a letter, um, it'll actually prompt and bundle based on what the more likely categorization is. So there is a shining light somewhere down the end of that, um, but definitely subscribe to the two keys um, and the ignition uh, perspective on that. Any other questions from the audience? Outside of your own um, companies, uh, Stephen uh, Ashutosh, um, and this is for everyone, including you, Britt, what is the most, um, or is there like one practical, actual application of AI that exists today uh, that has impressed you in talent acquisition? Are you, are you talking specifically around talent and, and, and because, for example, gene mapping is in, a classic example of... In, in, in talent acquisition, AI. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, she's not in talent yeah. or in HR. Yeah. In, in recruiting. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think um, generally speaking, you're going to get a lot of false negatives and false positives, but top of the funnel gathering, the way you guys described it before, I think is exactly right. I think that application actually works today, which is top of the funnel aggregation to create, not necessarily identify who you should hire, but maybe create a short list of people who you should interview. So now you're in your day, you're Nike and you're getting a million applications a month, mm. right? You can't, no humans can deal with a million applications a month, but a machine can probably give you the thousand people to consider for an interview, okay. right? So creating a short list, I think actually it does a pretty good job, but you're gonna have people fall through the cracks, no question about it. Scheduling? Yeah. Um, I would say data automation, anything that is highly repeatable and process driven. If we require you to fill out a form, uh, a robot can do a pretty good job of figuring out whether you filled out that form and send that form to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's boggling how many hours recruiters spend making sure that someone has filled out their um, compliance disclosure or what have you. Um, that is 100% already working and has very limited blast radius um, other than to take time away from you know, the manual labor of recruiting. I think in each of these, right, I feel like there are a number of things that, baby steps that AI has taken, which have been very, very effective. Like analytics is another big place. So, like everything that um, mentioned, right, whether it's sourcing, screening, scheduling, right? But even on analytics, right, what we find is that helping enterprises actually understand their diversity funnel. Like what is happening, where are the gaps? But is that like statistics or AI? So you have to infer number of things to enable that, where the bias is happening. Is it the bias because you just didn't find enough qualified candidates? You found enough qualified candidates, but there was an inherent bias in the organization. One very specific example, which I'm extremely proud of, is a few companies, what they are doing through our system is anonymizing every profile before it gets screened. Uh, so, I mean, given that we have a few minutes, right? One funny story. So in 1952, Boston Symphony decided to start doing blind auditioning. So what they did was, like for audition, right, you will put a curtain, someone will come play behind the curtain, and the other person, the judge will be on the other side, right? And the expectation was that that will remove all the gender bias. 
because prior to that, almost 90% of the people who were selected were all males, right? Guess what? It did not work. It had zero impact. Any guesses why? Heels. So because people were coming in, walking, in the, and the tuck, tuck, tuck of the heels gave away the gender of the person. So what they did was they changed the whole setup <laughs> that now you have to take your shoes off before the audition. And it worked phenomenally well. Okay. So what we found is that by, if you just mask that profile, but you have to do a really good job. You can't just do some, some minor work and expect it will work, right? Mm. And that is a difference between if, have you thought through the whole problem or not. We were able to change the bias from being 30% 70, 30 versus 70% to 49% versus 51%. Because, I mean, people have biases. So we are, at the end of the day, we are tribal. I would add an area I'm most excited about is that the diversity piece of, of doing just that, lining out data that may you know, give a better opportunity to someone that came from a you know, prestigious university versus someone who may be first generation at a state school. Um, blinding out names, zip codes, socioeconomic indicators as well. I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, use what data is available in a more refined way so we can make better decisions around our talent and, and be a practice um, more fairness as well in the early part of the funnel. Not after you've had an interview and you already know who they are and where they're from, um, but up front. Any other questions? No? That's it. Anything else you guys would like to add? I think one of the key things with AI, right, I would say there's both a lot of fear in the market, right? Whether it is around whether it will take away the job, to the other side whether it will introduce a bias, will it learn from my data and will perpetuate those biases, right? Uh, like whether this symphony example I was giving, with any of these things, I would say the world is here, things are happening. Now the more we can work, we can improve the things and make them be really, really effective. Few things always be careful of is the openness and transparency of these systems, the explainability of what is happening, why that is happening, really understand how the data is being incorporated, how it is learning from those things. But the more we embrace it, the better it will be for future, right? Uh, it can make our life much, much easier. Like whether you ask doctors whether they like to schedule manually, the answer is no one does that, right? Writing those bulk emails is not fun. Uh, mining those millions of profiles is not fun. And quite often, right, what happens even in our day-to-day -day life, right? We end up spending so much time on the mundane tasks and lose the focus of on the important things, right? This human touch, talking to people, building relationship, understanding, motivating them, is where humans really outshine, right? Machines, machines are good in just crunching the numbers, right? So let machines do that work, and humans focus on relationships, right? Yeah, I mean, I might just double down on, on the you know, user involvement, whether it's product or process. I think involving them in, whether it's um, design-based thinking, or process sprints, or other mechanisms that are available to break down the silos across HR, um, bring them closer to the process, and ultimately surface the things where you know, human interaction uh, is paramount, is valuable, is driving to the outcomes that you want to get to. Um, you know, embed, those, embed those practices into, into your work as practitioners and, and uh, encourage your teams to do those exercises, um, even if, you know, again, they're, they're you know, still having to certainly do their day jobs, find the, the ways that you can help them to carve out time to do that, because I think it's, it's uh, paramount to continue to differentiate ourselves in a very hot talent market, um, but also get, get more of, of the emerging parts of AI and robotics right. One thing I would add to what Neil had mentioned earlier is um, candidate data privacy is probably coming before the robots come. Um, and I think as uh, folks are thinking about these investments, um, meaningfully thinking through um, what is your own organization's level of comfort. Um, I think a lot of 
software providers in the space have gotten caught into GDPR, particularly focused on global talent. Um, but I think in the US, um, we're far behind the regulatory framework um, that will um, give us um, the liberties um, to continue to evolve this technology in the ways that it's currently evolving. Okay. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I think it's a really exciting topic area. Um, certainly you have everybody's information if you'd like to reach out um, independently after this. Thank you. Thanks, Britt. Thank you, Britt.